Hi, everybody. I hope you're still awake because it's going to be a mix between technical and a small story or something that happened not so long ago. So as you can see, it's the magic dump. And you know, you deploy in production and something always goes wrong. And that's what actually we experience. And uh, um, actually, in what I'm driving you through is just a, like a Cluedo-like experience. So we need to find who is the killer. And um, I just tell you a little bit where I am. Um, I live in Amsterdam. I'm Italian. I think you can get it from my accent. Um, I serve as an architect at Ice Mobile, a tiny company in uh, the Netherlands. We are part of a big uh, stock trade company. And uh, I have a love for a core dumping watch. So basically, my life is just the life of a debugger. So what I usually do, I, when there's something wrong, I get my hands dirty in the dump and find where the problem is. So just uh, I want to start with a disclaimer. Uh, what I'm going to show you didn't really take 20 minutes. I'm not working for Giant, and neither I work for Netflix. <laughs> Check my GitHub. Um, and another thing is that whatever I'm going to show you right now does not really work uh, uh, on Linux. It only works on SmartOS. But I mean, you should not worry, because you can still dump on Linux. Well, to be very honest, you can just get your core dump uh, from Linux. Um, so once upon a time, we deployed in production. And I knew that it was not a good idea. Because at 3 a.m., PagerDuty called me. And it was the, not the 3 a.m. that Yunong just said before, but um, it was still actually uh, the same kind of problem. Because we have customers in China, and 3 a.m. for me is opening time for their shop. So we had a few thousand users that they were offline, and we had a few uh, point of sale systems that they were not really working. So, this one was my scene. And it's a war room. That's actually what I found in front of myself, even if I was alone at home, by the way, in the middle of the night. And um, even if it kind of, you know, it sounds kind of romantic in that picture, it was still war, but it was still 3 AM in the night. And I had to solve this problem, because production was down. So this one is actually what was in front of my face. I had a beautiful infinite loop with uh, Amazon just shutting down machine and restarting machine over and over and over again. And it was actually going on for a few hours before actually PagerDuty decided to call me. By the way, I'm the last guy in the list of phone calls, which is not always good. Um, and that's actually what was going on. So we had the Elastic Load Balancer on AWS, was basically uh, with CloudWatch, was seeing the performance, and it was deciding every five minutes to shut down the machine and never give that machine back to me which is actually a problem, um, because I thought actually it was a nightmare. But in reality, it already happened in the afternoon, and nobody told me. So I could actually could sleep quietly, tightly in that night. But no, it was 3 AM still. So just to give you a little bit of context, um, this one is what we design. It's a very simple thing, even for not highly technical infrastructure people should be simple. Uh, we define actually a microservice context because, well, I'm not really a believer of microservices. Uh, so we have this beautiful machine, bare metal machine, with Nginx and Node. I think it's very clear. Nginx and Node. And it's a web service, nothing special. So I said, OK, let's the heck begin because it's 3 AM. I want to sleep a few hours, and I don't know really where to start. So first thing, I took a dump on AWS. Um, sorry, well, actually, I took a dump of Node on AWS, because I knew that something was wrong in our application. But the first thing that I did, just because you know I don't trust the machine where our, I don't trust Linux in general, but uh, what I did, I just took the dump, shipped it to a share file system. I took the application from GitHub, clearly, and deployed, thanks to Docker, uh, on SmartOS. And SmartOS is running, actually, at this moment on my machine. So you see the machine that did all the job is here, is the hero of that night. And the reason is very simple. Because if I want to go to bed anytime soon, before actually the sun rises in Amsterdam, and in the summer it rises very early, um, and I still don't want to take a day off sick from work, 
uh, I need to be fast. And the only way was actually to use two tools that are only available on SmartOS that are Dtrace and MDB. So I started with the Nginx because it was the first layer that was there. So my reverse proxy, I said, let me see if it's not crashing, if it's not caching wrong stuff. So that's what I did. Uh, is anybody familiar with Dtrace or D somehow? Well, I see a huge crowd, so Google it. Um, you will not find a lot of resources except some nice PDF. But once that you get uh, along with some examples from uh, Brandon Gregg, uh, you are able to write this kind of uh, script. And this one is a script that runs directly on the Nginx machine. So what I'm asking, without doing anything, so this one, it was running both on um, my local machine uh, and a remote machine that we have deployed on the cloud to basically support some kind of live data. Um, that's what I wrote. Basically, I asked that machine without restarting doing anything. I said, tell me what's going on on Nginx. And um, well, uh, it didn't actually tell me anything really new for me. Uh, the machine was growing insanely latency, which means so many things uh, that I had to exclude Nginx. But it's actually a good thing, because when you play Cluedo, you have to exclude people from being the uh, assassin. So I said, OK, it's good. It's not Nginx, but no. Oh! I need to go to Node. I was hoping it was Nginx. So what I did uh, was, uh, I think, 3.15, 15 minutes after. You know, it takes a while before you get warm up. Uh, I moved to the application, and the application actually, fortunately, is built using a decent uh, skill set of libraries. And I will make the people of Restify very happy. I make a statement, Restify or die. I mean, if you are running anything else, I'm sorry for happy or whatever else, you deserve to suffer at 3 a.m. in the night. Um, because what, I, what we decided to do when we redesigned all, all our stack, we w went away from Java. So you can see the talk where I theatrically explain how we did it. Uh, we decided to use Restify, add in some steroids, because you, know, you need to give it a little bit of flavor. And we create our own library called Virgilio HTTP. So only for the Italian people, Virgilio is clear, but it's from the Divine Comedy. You know, it's kind of nice also to tell the story. Read it online. And uh, um, so I'm not a strong believer of logger, so I had to find something that basically gave to management and people the sense that we were logging. But at the same time, I could use my own tool. You know, I like to play with my own tool. So I said, we are going to use Banyan. Banyan is already in Restify. We also use Banyan in all our application stack. And Banyan or die. That's it. That's a statement. And I explained to you why. So first thing that I said, OK, let me see what the heck is happening in my application. So what I did, I used uh, PRStat. It's a command on Solaris. You can use stop if you want. Um, and I run this script over and over. Every minute, I was getting basically stats from the application. And uh, well, nothing new to me because Ha, huh, there's latency means that my CPU is spinning up and my memory is growing. OK, well, good. First week at the university, I already learned this thing. And I said, I'm already ahead in my problem solving. So I said, well, this is actually nothing um, really new. And I need to be creative. So it was 3.30, something like that. Still no way to see my bed. So I said, OK, well. I don't believe it, but OK, let me check the logs. But because the application is live running, and we mirror all the requests from production to my machine, so I could have some kind of exact clone of what was happening in production, I said, OK, let's do some uh, log snooping. And I did it with Dtrace. So because Trent, the guy who created Banyan, uh, it's kind of obsessed with Dtrace, um, a little bit like me. He allow basically people to change the log level without restarting the application. So as you, not, as you all know, and I hope you're all doing, you are not uh, logging trace level in your, application, in your application. So I said, OK, I need to enable everything that I can because I really don't get what's going on. So what I did, and that's the magic of Dtrace, um, I said, OK, well, to be honest, it was 3.30 in the night, so don't expect me to write a full Dtrace script. Banyan has a shortcut, Banyan's man and P, and the PID of your node application. But if you're all interested to know what's going on, 
and you don't feel to read the source code because you're scared, uh, what Banyan is doing is basically I'm instrumenting Dtrace and tell him, okay, enlarge a little bit the, the size of data that you can give me, otherwise I don't see anything. And I say, okay, give me all the logs and tell me where this log was done. That's what this Dtrace script basically is saying here. And clearly for Banyan. Um, and by the way, this thing works if you only have one application running, otherwise it will never work. But you know, one node, one Nginx, one machine. So unfortunately, the logs, they reveal themselves to be as, usual, uh, as useless as I thought. Um, so basically, uh, it was getting very early in the morning and I still could not get the application live. The alternative was actually to serve static uh, JSON, but I don't think anybody would have liked it. So I said, okay, well, uh, let's keep Nginx. Nginx is not doing anything nice at this moment. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to uh, enable some stuff with Dtrace. And Node contains a lot of Dtrace probes that they tell us a lot of interesting information about uh, what's happening on the HTTP stack. It's an API, so I'm not doing Bitcoin mining. I would use Java for that. Um, so I said, okay, let me simulate what's happening in production. I open Siege and I just uh, start to make, uh, uh, simulate the same attack to my API. And well, I wrote a small uh, uh, Dtrace script. Uh, it's already on my GitHub, so you don't have to write it anymore. And what I did, I just said, okay, tell me what's going on in Restify uh, and show me all the latency and tell me which one is my handler that is spending most of his time trying to answer all the requests. So I, I run for five minutes, 200 concurrent requests. And I crashed my machine, by the way. Um, so I found that the handler that was creating all this problem. But unfortunately, uh, it was happening in the only service where we have only one handler that is a huge piece of code with a huge promise. So I said, and the pro for promising, we are using Bluebird. So I don't know if anybody of you is familiar with Bluebird, but just Google it and you will discover there are people that they write code to compile themselves and generate a library out of it, um, which actually is not really nice to trace. But okay, okay, it's almost morning. I already can foresee my, the sun rising and it's time to put my hands in the dump because I was already in a pile of dumps at that time. So the dirty job actually started. And uh, uh, the dirty job actually started, uh, luckily, very fast because uh, in production we are actually running node uh, 012 and we are run with this beautiful flag abort on a cut exception. What happens is that when your node crashes, we generate a core dump. The core dump lives in an um, elastic volume of AWS, so I can basically log in, get the dump, load in my smart OS, and play with it. Can build castle also. Um, so the application actually crashed several times, so I got a lot of dumps. Um, and basically, just to tell you what a dump is, uh, is basically where I was in that moment is the first definition of the Oxford Dictionary. And the second one is actually just a, a memory segment snapshot. So I had one gig, because the VA takes one gig, of snapshot of the memory at that moment. So I could see exactly what's going on. And I was pretty excited at that moment, even if it was not so the appropriate time to be excited. So first thing, okay. Um, I'm in SmartOS, so I can use a UMM debug, I can enable some stuff, and I can say to my uh, uh, node, just give me all the information about the garbage collector. Everything, every memory segment, put it down, I don't freaking care, I have enough swap to basically have it. Uh, don't do this thing at home, because it's gonna kill your uh, production machine, uh, as it's gonna log everything inside of the garbage collector. So I wrote a small bash script, I felt pretty happy, so every basically minute I was creating uh, uh, a snapshot of what was going on on the machine, plus I was g-coring my process. So I was, I was creating this core dump. And so the core dump basically is memory. So I had to find out where the heck the memory was leaking. And you have basically three spaces, and uh, you have an anonymous space, a stack, and heap, and you hope all the time is in the heap. And well, fortunately for me, it was there. Um, which basically, it's, it's, 
it means a lot of troubles. So there's a full, complete equality with troubles in type and in quantity. Uh, but at the same time, I was happy because I contained my problem in only one small thing that I needed to analyze, one gig of memory. Okay, so I said, let's recap. I have 200 concurrent users per second. Um, they are all signed requests. Uh, I have 16K of package that is going to travel every time uh, through that particular web service. Uh, every five minutes, everything crashes. CPU and memory are sky high. So, okay, I think I'm on the right way. And I started. So I took my core dump. I opened MDB. MDB is only available on SmartOS for now. So uh, if anybody feels to port it on Linux, you can also get it there. Um, what I did, I basically demangled all the symbols because it's clearly C++ and you don't want to read C++ at 4 o'clock in the morning. So loading the V8 symbols allows me to basically get uh, a match with uh, the objects in the JavaScript uh, in the V8 space. Um, and I said, okay, I feel that I'm really lucky today and with one command I can find my leak. So MDB actually has this beautiful command, find leaks, and um, sometimes it tells you exactly where the leak is. But unfortunately, like Google, uh, I feel like it never works. So it was getting very, very early. And after a few real espresso coffee, um, a real one, so very tiny, I could actually get uh, somewhere. And I said, OK, let me just try to find it. I need to find it. And I knew the name of the handler, because I only had one. The handler was called uh, uh, Do It, so pretty simple. Um, and in MDB, I can ask him, I can ask MDB, so load all the memory map and look for an object, look for all the objects that are called, do it. And I did it. He found it. I found the address, only one. Ooh, big surprise, one handler. Uh, and I said, okay, just print me out this object because I know that is an object, give me the object. But unfortunately, well, if life was so easy, I was already in bed, happy, everything was alive. So I had basically to um, go through a lot of things because they're all promises. So there's a jump around of function left and right. So MDB allows me basically to get uh, uh, the pointer of that particular handler because otherwise if I operate on the object I found before, I don't find anything except it's not an object, which is not helping me at all. So I found the reference and then I said, okay, now, I know that that particular memory allocation is getting peanuts, so just tell me all the references that that memory allocation had. So what I did, I took memory allocation, JScope. And uh, it took a while. So ta -ta -ra -ta -ra -ta -ta, ta -ta -ra -ra -ta. And it took a while because I don't have a super bare metal machine. I have just a MacBook Pro uh, with VMware. And... Uh, I finally got the property that was getting nuts. So what happened in that method is that I, I orchestrating a number of requests. I'm calling the database. I'm calling other APIs. I'm collecting everything, package it, and send it back to the mobile client. So it's a mobile API. This package is pretty big. And as you can imagine, the data most of the time doesn't change except all the signed data. So there are some user session information that they change for each user. Um, so actually, my expectation was that all the data that was not dynamic would be cached. And I was pretty sure that in my design there was a cache somewhere. I was 100% sure. So I said, OK, um, now I got the property that is getting peanuts, and I want to find, I got all the references, I know how many they are, and now I want to find all the objects that are linked to that particular property. Because my, ex my expectation is that there were not so many objects because they, they should have been cached. By the way, the property is called return value. So that's. But unfortunately, the ta -ta, ta 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 went on for a little bit too long than expected, and I found more than a million uh, references to that object, which actually was not good because I said, well, let, let, me, let me rethink. I have an object, I have a property. Most of the link to that property are just cache value, so I'm not expecting to get them anywhere else. And unfortunately, there are a million references to one particular property that is basically the biggest object that we are transporting to the mobile client, which is the entire application content, by the way. And well, it felt strange from the beginning. Um, 
So unfortunately, I said, okay, um, okay, but I'm not going on GitHub. So what I do, I say, I have this object because it's a snapshot of memory. I knew exactly when it was crashing. I saw it. It was there in front of my eyes. And I say, give me the source code because if my assumption is right, that object is cached. So we use a C++ convention internally to prefix uh, some of the variables. That is something that I learned from some crazy guy uh, down in San Francisco. And they said, yeah, you should prefix your variable. And I learned that sometimes it's a good signal for, your, for yourself to see something that you want really to mark as, OK, this value, this value is cached. So I, I call it C underscore. It means that it's cached, right? So I'm, I was expecting to find it there. So I said, give me the source code. Because I can ask him the source code of that pointer. He's going to show it to me. Uh, but unfortunately, the variable didn't have the C underscore in front. So I said, ah, eh, OK, I have the feeling that we are not using the, the object that we are linking, but we are using the value of that object every time and copied over and over and over and over and over and over again. Um, we cannot use CDN for that object because we can, there are some session information. So I don't want everybody on the internet to see them. And uh, what I discovered is that somebody, maybe he also called it at 3 o'clock in the night, he forgot to reference the correct object. And uh, uh, even if you should all write JavaScript, there's still a little bit of C++ inside of every core developer. So somebody actually forgot to reference the correct object. And it was actually 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, the sun was rising. I, I was running out of Nespresso, wh which is a drama, because you need to order it online, and they deliver the day after. Um, and they don't open, actually, at 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, and I was awake for three hours after a beautiful sleep that I was having. I was dreaming. And I, I was wake up by a nightmare. And my worst nightmare was a typo. I mean. Seriously, 6 o'clock in the morning. So um, it was just one chart changed. So I got people that they say, yeah, you're not contributing any, a lot in our code base, in our internal code base, because I'm not writing a lot of business logic. I'm more writing uh, our core frameworks. Um, and that day, I was happy because I made my contribution for the day. There was one chart change. So it's beautiful when in GitHub you make one chart change. You see the tiny plus. It's so beautiful. Uh, but we were back alive, actually. So I was actually back to get something up and running. And that day, actually, I realized that uh, um, it was one of the happiest days of my life that I proved that technology that almost nobody uses, they are really useful to save your sleep. And um, it was not uh, so long ago that the guy from Joyent, Dave Pacheco, came out with this uh, sentence, and he said that, um, debugging is much harder than coding because it requires you to know the deepest level of your machine where your software is running. And I think it's actually highly true, uh, especially because uh, I'm the only guy that put his hands in the dumps. Uh, I kind of like it because at the same time, it allows me to go as deep as possible in knowing our application. And um, yeah, I hope a lot of you guys also, they want to put on your gloves and gets hands dirty on dumps, because it's actually fun. Um, and uh, I didn't show any code because, well, uh, internet is not really going well. Maybe we should detrace it and see what's going wrong. Um, but if you are really, and also because on this screen I cannot show you my, my console. is I'm using uh, eight points font size. So, um, so I, I'm not going to make my font bigger. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I can invite you to do, if you want to check what I really did, I have basically something like running on my machine. You can just find me around, and uh, we can watch the dumps together. And if you have a core dump that you want me to watch, I can always watch and help you. Um, so thank you for listening and being with me in that three hours that I was awake, and I could not enjoy a beautiful dream. So. <laughs> I really don't know if I'm out of time, but whatever. If you have questions or if you want to play with MDB and so on, feel free to ping me and I can 